Jesus. I don't know about you Bola girls, but if you wake up in the middle of the night and you go pile in mom and dad's bed, what happens? They tell you, they kick us out. <laughs> that was probably the nice version. They tell you, go back to bed, right? Yep, go back to, you, to bed and get, get in your own bed, right? So we remember that when we're awake and we can't sleep or we're worried or scared or whatever, what are we going to do? We're going to talk to Jesus. Let's pray about that. Father, we thank you that Jesus never fails us, that he's always awake and alert and ready uh, for all of our needs. We're so thankful that you gave your son. And so we'll never put him away. We'll keep him in our hearts, but we'll never put him away. And we thank you. We give you praise, honor, and glory, and we pray it in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Terry, you got him today? Okay. There you go. Letty is wound for sound today. Maybe that'll mean a good nap today, Daddy Ben. I tell you, I wrote my notes and I had to go back and re-review a couple times as it seemed like it's been an eternity since I wrote them. But as I put them together and as God just laid this message on my heart, I'd had some notes laid aside for a long time. And I was so disappointed last week when we couldn't be together because I just feel like somebody needs to hear this message. And so even though there aren't many of us here today, I pray that whoever it is that needs to hear this hears it loud and hears it clear and that it lays on their heart and helps to make a difference in their lives. And we also have a lot of people that listen online to the online sermons that I put on there. We usually have uh, anywhere from, uh, well, I think our lows like 57 a week up to even 200 a week that listen online. Um, and so maybe it's somebody online that needs to hear it, but um, just please keep in prayer that whoever needs to hear this message um, here's it out and makes a difference in their life. We're going to start right out this morning. Man, I got crackly things going on. Deep pocket. Hang on, I'm going to readjust. Okay. It's all kinds of little wires and thingies that hang out. We'll see if they hang out better now. We're going to start by turning in our Bibles and just go to our scripture right off the bat. And it's a short but powerful scripture today. It's from the book of 1 Corinthians, which I think most of us are very familiar with. And we're going to read 1 Corinthians 14.33, short but powerful verse. And that verse says, taken way out of context, but hear my heart, and as the message unfolds, I think you'll hear it clearly. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregations of the Lord's people. I'll repeat that one more time. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregations of of the Lord's people. This is the word of God for the people of God. Be to God. Chaos or peace can change in a moment's notice, can it? Can go from one to the other in light speed. I sense as I was making notes and re-reviewing this, that I probably give messages on the subject of peace maybe more than any other subject. And the reason that I do that is, is that God lays it on my heart that somebody is seeking peace and somebody needs to hear those messages about peace. In fact, I think sometimes there are people that almost need someone to give them permission to have peace in their life. Therefore, I preach on peace. I see so many lives, and so do you, in complete chaos and so many that are seeking peace as a result. Everywhere we go, we see someone's life that's in chaos. 
And without a doubt, when we're in chaos, we're in the, when we're in the midst of chaos, we are longing for peace. A lot of times we're in the midst of chaos and our prayer is, oh God, just bring me some peace, right? We're seeking peace. So let's break it down a little bit and go a little bit deeper. If you do just a little bit of research on the Bible, and I didn't have to look far to find this, there are references to peace in the King James Version. If we just take one version, in the King James Version of the Bible, there are references to peace in the Old Testament nearly 500 times. That's pretty significant, yes? But references to chaos and or confusion is in the thousands. Do you see What's going on there? In fact, when I was making my notes, and I make them and then I preach right out of them, see my little scribbled up page on the back side there, I've got all kinds of scripture references for both chaos and peace. Chaos, conflicts, thousands of times, 479 plus times in the King James Version, goes on and on and on and on. But reference to chaos and confusion comes over the top by the thousands to the references to peace. And it should be no surprise. It comes up in a lot of scripture, and I'll rattle this off really fast. But just a few of the scripture references that I found for, for peace were in Psalms, many of them. Psalms 29, 11, 34, 31, 37, 37, 120, the seventh verse, are just a few. And even less surprisingly, that pesky book of Proverbs that wants to tell us how to live our lives and what to do and what not to do, refers to chaos and conflict over and over and over again. I've got, I just wrote down one, two, three, four, five, six immediate references, but there are dozens in the book of Proverbs. So why is it, and why does it seem that chaos comes on us so much more frequently than peace? Maybe it's just me, but does it happen at your house too? <laughs> there is so much more chaos than there is peace in our lives. And even if we shut off the evening news, there's still a lot of chaos out there, isn't there? Since we know that God is not the author of chaos and confusion, we're left with a logical conclusion that Satan uses anyone and anything possible to steal our peace. It's a Satan thing. And we've got to be aware of that. It can be sneaky, it can be subtle, or it can be flat out just crazy, but Satan is out to steal our peace. Why? Because when we're peaceful, we're focused on God. We're focused on the good things, on the positive things. When our world is rocking and rolling, that just leaves the door at least cracked, if not wide open, for Satan to come in and do his dirty work. So he loves chaos and confusion, and he'll create it any way that he can. And I don't know about you, but does it seem like certain individuals are more prone to creating chaos? They thrive on chaos. If there isn't chaos going on, they're creating it. The modern day term for that for some people is a drama queen. Gotta have some kind of drama going on all the time. 
it seems as though there are those that aren't happy unless someone or something in their circle is in turmoil. Now, that may sound like a really warped sense of reality or some kind of a sickness, but trust me, I think almost all of us know someone who is exactly that way. Have you ever heard of what I think what they commonly call a fire starter? A fire starter is a person who creates chaos and confusion anonymously. Now, it can be a fire thing. It can be, and, and, and fire departments know of this phenomenon, that someone would go out and start fires and then disappear into the background and watch them burn while the chaos of fire departments and volunteers and whatever are trying to put it out. They thrive on chaos and they'll do damage and risk themselves, not only their life, but their freedom in order to do something like this. And I just use a fire starter as an example. There's all kinds of other examples of creating chaos. Peace. Don't we want peace? I think I have a picture there, Dexter, of a deer. Can't hardly read it. But it's Isaiah 43, 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. We want more peace. Amen? We want more peace. Amen? Amen. We feel like we strive toward it, and yet it seems to often evade us. But be clear, Satan wants us to have strife in our lives. It's that distraction that I spoke of a few minutes ago, but God calls us, his people, to something different, to something more. God calls us to himself. When I was talking to the little people about in the middle of the night and you wake up, does anybody here ever wake up during the middle of the night and fret and fuss and, boy, I can see not one's going to admit it. <laughs> yeah, sure we do. We all have at some point, right? Maybe you don't do it regularly, but maybe you do. And that's what I talk to the little ones about, about drawing themselves closer to Jesus, that Jesus is always there. And that's what God wants of us. It's what he expects of us, is to draw us closer to himself, to get strong in his word and hang tight when there's little else to hang on to. And God's word instructs us very clearly to live in unity and harmony. Very clearly. God doesn't tell us to go out and start wars or fights with our neighbors or fusses with our family. He clearly tells us over and over again that we are to live in unity and harmony. I was reading a little quote by Joyce Meyer this week, and she says, and I quote her, Satan works through weakness in our flesh to keep the atmosphere in your life and the attitudes of your heart in constant turmoil. Ooh, that's discouraging, isn't it? She went on to say some other wonderful things that I won't share today, but it's true, right? Satan just works on our hearts to keep us stirred up so that we miss the good stuff. But consider this, my friends. Just consider this for a moment. God's power is greater than Satan's could ever hope to be. Amen? God's power is greater than anything that Satan could ever hope to be. So when strife and chaos and confusion come against us, just claim power in the name of Jesus. Pray the name of Jesus. Cry out the name of Jesus. And he will respond with a peace that passes all understanding. And I didn't make that up. I read that in a good book somewhere. 
You've heard me say before that people say all the time, Pastor Donna, I feel like I pray the same prayer over and over. I just don't know how to pray. I'm uncomfortable in prayer. And I tell people this, just break it down and make it real simple. Just pray the name of Jesus. Just pray the name of Jesus. And you really only have to say it once unless you feel called to continue to repeat it because he'll be there to comfort you, to guide you, to direct you. I had someone I just talked to a couple of weeks ago and they had a major decision to make in their life and they wanted some pastoral guidance. And they said to me, well, I've been praying and praying and praying about this and I haven't gotten an answer, but in my life I figured out that if God doesn't answer me, that means go ahead and do what it is that you want to do said, well, you asked for pastoral guidance, you're going to get it. And it's not going to be what you think. What are the three answers to prayer? Yes, no, and wait. Ugh. And sometimes it seems forever, doesn't it? But how many times have we prayed and heard that answer of wait or we haven't even heard an answer so we keep waiting and then we get back later and we realize how wise God was and what he protected us from of what we were praying for. Oh God, I've got to do this. I've got to have that. I've got to go here. This has got to happen. This can't happen. And then we get a few years down the road, maybe even a few decades and we realize that God protected us through it all by not giving an answer. And I began to think in my own life that a lot of times the reason God doesn't tell me no, even though that would have been the obvious answer, would have been because I was going to pull up my drawers, put my hands on my hips and say, hang on, watch this. And do it anyway. We don't like to be told no. And God knows that. Claiming the name of Jesus in prayer and he will respond with that peace that passes understanding. Now, when you have that peace that passes understanding that comes upon you, that doesn't mean that all the chaos is going to disappear, right? But Jesus, but with Jesus in your heart, you can handle it. You can get by A lot of times it's difficult to, to envision a positive outcome when we're in the middle of a mess. But making beautiful endings out of impossible situation is God's specialty. He just takes us, this beautiful mess, his creation that he loves so much and does stuff that just knocks your socks off. God never wastes a trial in our lives, my friends. He never wastes a trial. So be encouraged by that. Your trial today is going to be his triumph tomorrow. But now here we go. What do we do if we have a chaos maker in our midst? Hmm? It's okay. Okay. You can think of specific people. You can think of specific situations. But we all have them, right? Maybe we don't have them right now, but we've had them in the past. What do we do with that when we have a chaos maker in our midst? Well, believe it or not, I think I figured out the best way, or maybe not the best way, is to not try to put a stop to it or not get caught up in it. So as my friend Pastor Barb says, kill it with love. Don't be afraid to confront it, but don't do it in a correcting manner because you're not going to stop a chaos maker. How do we kill it with love? How are we strong enough to stop the chaos maker in our life? 
I've got some ideas, three things I came up with. One is that we have to set boundaries. Uh-oh. How many of you need to set boundaries in your life? Yeah, yeah, a lot of us do. Maybe it's in some things, maybe it's in everything. Setting boundaries is so important that every other year they torture we pastors with a day-long training that we have to go to about setting boundaries. Why would that be, do you wonder? Why would it be so important for them to spend the money to get a trainer in and buy us a bunch of fancy materials and haul us off to Timbuktu to teach us about boundaries? It's important because things get just wildly out of control and then there's no boundaries and then you're just drowning in your own sea of sorrows and everybody else's sea of sorrows. Boundaries are important. So when you're setting boundaries with a chaos maker, try this. Be loving, but be firm. And under no circumstances, let yourself be pulled into the drama. Well, I'm just going to go and tell so and so off. Why don't you ride along with me? Not in a hundred years, honey. Or would you call so-and-so and and tell them that I said, "Mm -mm, nope, not betting on that deal. But a lot of times it's not that obvious, is it? It's much less obvious than that. But be aware and be firm and don't let yourself be pulled into the drama. Number two, know scripture and use it. Do I keep harping on this? You've got to know the word of God to have the power of God within you. This requires preparation on your part. Arm yourself with the word of God and use it. I think it was this week, I think, Shelly, did I tag you in that picture with, that, with the armor of God? That was a great picture. I pulled that up and we'll show it another time. We've got to be ready. Because the world is on full attack, and if you've got a chaos maker or two or six or ten in your life, you know exactly what I mean. It's just a matter of time. And a good way to start with Scripture is to take the Scripture from a Sunday morning and go home and reread that several times and study it and look up stuff. Almost all of you are on the Internet. Google it. Figure out what it means. Memorize it. Today's a shorty. Maybe there'll be a test coming up soon for today's scripture. Number three, be confident in knowing that God is on your side. God is with you. Begin to pray if things start to wind up and spin out of control. Pray silently. Pray out loud. Claim the word of God in peace, but pray, pray, pray. Remember that your actions and or reactions to the chaos maker could be a pivot point in their lives. You just might set a tone for the change in their lives. You can't change people, right? But you can set an example that causes them to look at it and decide that that they need to make a change. And your tone and your actions and reactions can set that stage that those people might just see something that they want in their lives. And in the midst of it all, don't be insecure. Because God put you in such a time as this. Have you heard those words before? God puts you exactly where you need to be. To be his angel to someone who desperately, desperately needs it. Spent a fair amount of time talking to Fred and Luana. I'll pick on them for a minute. But they've had plenty of cause to doubt and question in unwarranted chaos in their lives. And yet we talked about the people that they've met along this path and the lives that they've touched, that they only would have happened because of the situation. God 
is using them in a mighty way even through the adversity of all that's gone on. And we thank him for that, even in the midst of the storm, amen? Even in the midst of the storm. I think I have a little Charlie Brown picture. Oh, those are too small. <laughs> Charlie Brown Snoopy on the bench there. I am at a place in my life where peace is a priority. I make deliberate life choices to protect my mental, emotional, and spiritual state. That's probably a little wordy for Charlie Brown, but you get the point. Boundaries. Set them and keep them. They're a treasure. I read a story just recently about an ancient Chinese emperor who had tons of gardens. He sat in his castle or whatever his abode was on the hill and overlooked his land and he had beautiful gardens and orchards and things there. And this is actually a true story. And he loved, there was a specific tree that he particularly loved and he cultivated it and he had for decades and, and had this cultivar just perfect and he'd look out and he would just, it would just do his heart good to look out and see these trees thriving and carrying on. And he had acres and acres of them and they were very valuable financially as well. But one morning he got up per his usual routine, rubbed the sleep out of his eyes, stretched and yawned as he went to the window to look out and he was horrified. There was some kind of covering over the top of all of his trees. He couldn't figure it out. All he could see was that the morning dew was laying on it and there was just something that looked almost like a blanket covering those trees and in his mind immediately he thought, they'll suffocate, they'll die. What in the world is going on? Well, as he sent his people down to see what was going on, they discovered that it was webs. He had a critter problem. And overnight, just like that, his beautiful trees were covered with this thick white web coating. And I don't know much about trees or farming, but that can't be a good thing, right? What was he going to do? The webs were everywhere, and they were quickly snuffing out the life of his beloved trees. And the emperor was furious because he controlled everything in his kingdom, and there wasn't a darn thing he could do about it. He was devastated. He stomped, and he yelled, and he cried, and he created chaos right there in his own castle and across the whole kingdom. Now, the emperor's wife was used to his little fits now and then. This was a big fit. This one took fit of all fits. And she tried to console her husband and escape his rage. And so to do that, she decided that she was going to go down to the orchard and take a closer look herself. And thinking that her meager effort that she could make one-on-one -on -one would be better than nothing, she commenced to gently pull the webs off of the first trees that she got to. But as she pulled, the webbing didn't just come away. It came away in these thin strands. And as she pulled at them, she couldn't break them. They were amazing. She was convinced she had to do something, and so she fetched the village tailor to come and look at them. And these strands were really, really fine, and they were really, really strong, and they were so soft. And so the village tailor, who was specialized in making the finest clothing in the land, came and he looked it over and he said, I think we can do something with this. And so they got people to start pulling the webbing away and all of these strands and they wound them up and the tailor got someone to spin them into cloth and he made the most desirable clothing that anyone had ever seen. How did all this happen? Because those strands didn't just appear out of anywhere. It turned out it had been an invasion of the silkworm. 
and that was all silk across all those trees. Little teeny tiny worms that had crept from wherever they'd been before to this forest and invaded this certain kind of tree and spread their web all over. Well, as you can imagine, as the story ends, the emperor became even more rich off of the discovery of silk. They were able to clean it off the trees because everyone wanted the silk. And the seeming curse all of a sudden turned into a blessing with the discovery. Chaos and confusion. But God was there all the time. Is there someone or something that you need to let go in order to gain peace in your life? I struggled with peace this week in one area, and I'm pretty sure that most of you at least heard about it, and that was the decision in New York to sign the bill that approved abortions up to the time of birth. And there's a whole bunch of backlash from that. Well, that's not what we really did. Well, yes, it is. And you can go into the whole abortion issue and whatever, but I don't think there's anybody on earth that wouldn't agree that you've got to think hard before you decide that abortion is okay at the time of birth, at a full-term baby. And it rocked my world. I didn't feel peace anymore. I mean, I felt like I was crying out to God inside, what in the world have we done? What has this world come to? It caused chaos in my heart. I know people that would give almost anything to have a child, be it an infant or an older child or whatever, and yet now this is quote-unquote legal. And I had to work really hard to begin to pray for the people that made the decision to make this happen. There were a lot of pictures on the internet and on the news of uh, Governor Cuomo and his people gathered around a desk as he signed the legislation and they were laughing and clapping. It rocked my world. It took away my peace. But then I remembered, God is in control. God is in control, amen? Even in the craziness of the world, God is in control. And so it made me go back to exactly what I'd written in my notes the week before. Is there something or someone that you need to let go in order to gain peace in your life? I can't answer that question for you. Only you can answer it for yourself. But if there is, I'm going to tell you right now that God gives you permission to let it go. Or to let them go. Or to let the situation go. God gives you permission for that. And God gives you permission, if it's necessary, to let that relationship die so that you can thrive in his word for his kingdom. You might have to create a drastic change if you can't control the chaos that some people bring to your life. It doesn't mean that you don't care anymore doesn't mean that you love them any less but it means that you care enough about God's creation in you because it's all about you at this stage of the game it means that you care enough about God's creation in you that you set boundaries that cut off the chaos and create peace in your life <clears throat> Remember our scripture from today, 1 Corinthians 14, 33. God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. Or in the version of the message, which I commonly call the hippy-dippy Bible, but I love sometimes the way it says it, <clears throat> and I love this verse that said, when we worship the right way, God doesn't stir us up into confusion. He brings us into 
harmony. Mm. Be at peace, my friends. Be at peace and trust God's leading in your life. Let's pray. Father God, it's a tough message to hear when we know that we have chaos makers in our circle and we maybe have tried and tried to no avail. But we thank you that your word gives us permission to remove ourselves from that and do what we need to do to be peaceful in your word and in your kingdom. So God, I pray for strength for those that are here today that know that they need to make this move. I pray for those that are chaos makers that somehow that peace that passes understanding can come into their lives and that they can know your peace, the peace that only you can bring. We pray it in your precious and your holy name. Amen. Let's stand together for our closing number, Wonderful Peace. And if you know this, sing it out because I think Roberta and I talked about it, but I'm not sure, so... depths of my spirit tonight rolls a melody sweeter than song in celestial like strings it ceasingly fails or my soul like an infinite calm peace peace wonderful peace down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray, in fathomless billows of love. What a treasure I have in this wonderful peace very deep in the heart of my soul so secure that no power can mine it away while the years of eternity roll peace peace wonderful peace down from the father above Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray, in fathomless billows of love. I am resting tonight in this wonderful peace, resting sweetly in Jesus' control. For I'm kept from the danger by night and by day, and his glory is flooding my soul. Peace, peace, wonderful peace, coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit wherever I pray in fathomless billows of love. A soul, are you here without comfort and rest, marching down the rough pathway of time? Make Jesus your friend ere the shadows grow dark. Oh, accept the sweet peace so sublime. Peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down, Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray, in fathomless billows of love.
Dexter, leave that last screen up there with the chorus on it, the one you just clicked off of. Can you click back on that? With that peace, peace, wonderful peace. Peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray, in fathomless billows of love. Be careful what you ask for. Right there. Be careful what you pray for. It just may come true. God may just grant that wonderful peace that we pray for, that we sing about in a song that we long so much for, but oftentimes don't seem to see. Father God, this day, as we search for peace, we have much anticipation in our life. Bitter cold weather coming and we fuss and we worry and it, and it makes us feel as though there's chaos. But you bring peace. Father, we fuss and we worry over those that are not doing well, that are under the weather, that have chronic illnesses. But Father, you bring us wonderful peace. Father, we worry about those that travel. We worry about our car starting and getting in and out and doing what we need to do. But Father, you bring wonderful peace. Father, we pray that you would help us to end the chaos in our lives, to set healthy boundaries to do what we need to do to have this wonderful peace. Father, as we lift our lives to you and as we call out the name of your son Jesus as we search for peace, may it be so. And may our lives be changed and the lives of those around us. May our lives reflect something that those chaos makers need to know, that you are the father of wonderful peace. We pray it in your precious and your holy name. Amen.